It was the morning of May Lynn's ninth birthday, and John Willis Jr. had returned from Florida to celebrate with his girlfriend and her daughter in Dorchester, Massachusetts. As he laid in bed with them, he reflected on how he'd finally found what he'd always wanted a family and a sense of belonging, even if it meant finding it in the most unimaginable way possible. But little did he know that his dark past as the most notorious gangster in Asian organized crime would soon be knocking on his door to haunt him, literally. Willis had muscled his way up through the ranks of the criminal underworld, becoming the first white man to rise so high in this narrow-minded underworld. He was the kingpin, mastermind, and leader of a vast criminal operation. Extortion, prostitution, and vicious assaults were his bread and butter. And so as Willis had finally found his sense of belonging, dozens of armed cops in helmets and bulletproof vests found their way to his house, pounding on his front door. He knew what he had to do. He gently lifted Mei Lin from her sleep, told his girlfriend to stay in the room, and shut the door behind him as he ran down the steps. The tension in the air was so heavy, you could cut it with a knife. He knew that they were there to arrest him, and he could see the determination in their eyes, but he was equally determined to protect his loved ones at all costs. As the standoff continued, Willis could hear his girlfriend and Mei Lin upstairs. The sound of their breathing echoed in his mind. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the police made their move. Willis braced himself for the worst as they stormed into the house, guns drawn. At first glance, you would describe John Willis to be nothing more than a big white guy with a Boston accent. But if you looked closer, you might notice his tattoos. A dragon for strength, a koi for prosperity, and Chinese characters for strength, righteousness, and pain. He was known as the White Devil, the only white man to have found a place at the top of Boston's Chinatown gangs. John Willis's childhood was far from easy. Born in 1971, he grew up in Dorchester, Boston as a white Irish kid with a father who was an abusive alcoholic carpenter and collected money for the Irish mob on the side. When Willis was just three years old, his father broke the jaw of a mobster and fled to North Carolina, leaving his wife and son behind. The abandonment left Willis with a boiling anger that he liked to channel into hockey on a good day, but his bad days resulted in violent outbursts like beating a kid with a chair. One fateful day, Willis screamed. I hope you die at his half-brother, who intervened after Willis tried to kick a girl for spitting at him. Tragically, his half-brother died two days later of a coke-induced heart attack, leaving Willis with a huge feeling of guilt and grief. Unfortunately, Willis's life only continued to spiral downward. His mother had both legs amputated due to diabetes, and Willis became her primary caregiver at the young age of 13. A year later, she passed away suddenly from a heart blockage, leaving him alone with his two half-sisters, who were so deep into their drug abuse that they didn't even care. He recalls this period of his childhood as the time when he had to become a man in an hour. However, in reality, he was just a young, scared child. He lived in his dead brother's cold house with no money for food or heating, but remained determined to protect himself and channel his anger into something productive. That's when Willis discovered weightlifting and steroids. As you can imagine, he was still very angry, but now he was also extremely bulky. At the age of 16, Willis could easily pass for an adult, and so he took advantage of this by getting a job as a bouncer near Fenway Park. The area was frequent by the Asian community, whom he was warned to avoid during to their alleged involvement in organized crime. However, one night a fight broke out and Willis broke it up, punched the attacker, and took the victim to the restroom to rinse his eyes. Turns out that the man he helped was Vaping Joe, a young Chinese gangster who was very grateful for Willis's protection. Joe gave Willis his card and told him to call if he ever needed anything. A few days later, down to his last 76 cents and desperate for food and warmth, Willis went to his half-sister's house, but she refused to answer the door, leaving him helpless in the freezing cold. Remembering Joe's card, he called the number, not expecting much, but to his surprise, five minutes later, two BMWs pulled up full of stylish Asian men in flashy black suits and gelled hair. They took him to a house belonging to the Ping Ong Gang, an Asian criminal organization that controlled the illegal gambling dens and massage parlors in Boston. The house was full of men, women, and children. They fed him, gave him $500 cash, and a bed for the night. The next day, they took him shopping for custom suits, a pager, and a brick-sized cell phone, and even styled his hair into Ping On's trademark spikes. Willis was stunned. 
He had grown up in neglect, sleeping on the floor in front of an open oven to keep warm, and now he was being embraced like family by people he'd only met a few days before. When they asked him to go to New York for training with the Hong Mun, a gang faction close to Ping On, he didn't think twice. He ditched school and moved to New York's Chinatown, immersing himself in a culture and language he couldn't understand. No one could speak to him in English, and he was as hopeless with chopsticks as with the girls at the karaoke bar where his fellow gang members hung out most of the night. However, he was quick to learn Cantonese, Poissonese, and Vietnamese, mostly as a way to impress the ladies. He also observed and copied the basic principle of the culture, exchanging his trademark temper for calm and respect, particularly towards elders. Soon he knew the proper way to pour tea and secretly learned the lines to a Chinese pop song so he could take the mic at karaoke. Of course, his gang training wasn't just singing and tea parties. They gave him a gun, which he practiced in a slaughterhouse. Then came his first assignment, committing robberies for the infamous Leo brothers. His first attempt was sloppy. He barged into a sweatshop and was met with gunfire that he barely escaped from. He fled for his life, but it only encouraged him to become better and more aggressive. Word soon spread about the the new white guy from Boston whose favorite hobbies were doing steroids and being angry. Once when a restaurant owner criticized him in Cantonese, assuming he wouldn't understand, Willis broke the place up into pieces. Another time when a man they intended to rob had cuffed his cash-stuffed briefcase to his wrist, they simply whipped out a machete and, well, you know, took the briefcase with the man's hand no longer attached to his body. After two years in New York, Willis had earned fear, respect, and the nickname Buck White John, meaning White Devil John. After his training was complete, Willis was called back to Boston and was assigned a new role to be a bodyguard and enforcer for Bike Ming, a gambling den kingpin. He wasn't the highest ranking kingpin in the Asian underworld, but Willis respected him a lot and soon became his right hand. In turn, Ming became his mentor and taught Willis the power of respect and most importantly to never get involved in drugs as they brought too much trouble. With rising violence in Boston, Willis found it hard to keep his hands clean, which landed him in jail a few times. There he made some strategic friendships and discovered the true economical potential of the drug trade. Despite going against the teachings of his Asian gang members, Willis succumbed to temptation and began dealing drugs to earn the big bucks. He started off with dealing small amounts of marijuana and gradually progressed to selling larger quantities of drugs, including cocaine. During his time in jail, he made a connection with a Florida-based supplier who could provide him with vast amounts of Oxy, the highly addictive opioid painkiller responsible for the deaths of over a million Americans at the time. Upon his release, he formed a crew and rented a a luxurious mansion on the Pompano Beach waterfront, where they worked long hours to replace the multivitamin pills of thousands of bottles with oxy pills. They then shipped the pills to Cape Cod, where they were sold at a staggering 66% markup. Unfortunately for the newly addicted residents of Massachusetts, Willis's operation was a huge success. In under two years, he'd shipped over 260,000 pills, earning over $4 million. He claims that he made 10 times that amount, though. With his newfound wealth, he indulged in a lavish lifestyle, purchasing high-end vehicles such as speedboats, motorcycles, a Porsche, a Red Hummer, and a Bentley. He even bought a nightclub and a second mansion. Now, that's what I call living the corrupt dream. Willis even managed to find love with a beautiful woman named Anwen, who was 13 years younger than him. He also developed a deep affection for her daughter, Mei Lin, whom he loved as his own. However, on Mei Lin's ninth birthday, everything would come crashing down. If Willis had just kept a low profile, he might have been able to continue fueling the opioid frenzy for a while longer, but that was not his style. Now he was rich and powerful, and he wanted everyone to know it. This attitude would soon cause his downfall. In March 2011, Mei Lin was forced to celebrate her ninth birthday without him, as 40 officers armed with machine guns stormed Willis's house and took him into custody. They seized 12,000 oxycodone pills, $480,000 in cash, and 13 firearms during the arrest. At 42 years old, Willis was charged with drug trafficking and money laundering. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 20 years behind bars. As part of his sentence, he had to forfeit his 38-foot speedboat, his collection of luxury cars, 
and $2 million. As he sat in his jail cell, Willis thought back on his life and the choices he'd made. He'd always known that his criminal activities would catch up with him eventually, but he'd never imagined that it would cost him the only thing that truly mattered to him, his family. In the end, Willis realized that he'd been chasing the wrong dream all along. True happiness, he realized, could not be found through money, power, or drugs. It could only be found through love and family, and for him, that dream had come too late.